And we said that spin was something that we had to postulate that each particle has because that was the only way we could explain the magnetic properties of an atom. Okay, so we said we can explain magnetic properties in terms of charge, the orbital angular momentum of charged particles like the electrons, but that wasn't enough to fully explain the properties of the atom. So we have to postulate the existence of some other source of magnetism for the atom, and we said and that's the electron spin. Okay. And so uh, we said that for an electron, the or since there is no classical analog for spin angular momentum, we say that we're just going to assume that those operators for the spin angular momentum properties behave the same way as the orbital angular momentum in terms of the way they commute. So in other words, we postulated that we can only know the magnitude of the spin angular momentum and the comp one of the components. Just like you can only get the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum and one of its components. And we choose the Z component as the one we want to know. Okay? Now, um, there is, in fact, one more thing we do need to consider. Because of the existence of spin, there is a thing called a spin-orbit interaction. And that's what we're going to focus on today. All right, spin orbit interaction has to do with the fact that, all right, if you have an electron going around a nucleus, okay, imagine you're an observer at the electron, okay, so imagine yourself sitting at the electron and you're looking out and you see the nucleus. What would the nucleus seem to be doing? Because you're moving around the nucleus, okay, uh, like you're, you're on Earth, right? The Earth's moving around the sun. Correct? So you have an orbital motion of the Earth around the Sun. And so, but since you're on the Earth, by looking at the Sun, what does it seem like it's what's going on? It's as if it's the Sun that's going around you, right? The sun is setting, Sun is rising. Goes, it, so because of the orbital motion of the electron, it's as if okay, there is a positive charge that's orbiting the electron from the viewpoint of someone on the electron, right? So you can say then that the electron essentially feels a magnetic field from the nucleus because of its orbital motion around the nucleus. All right. So since the electron itself has an intrinsic magnetism due to its spin, okay, then depending on how the electron's spin is aligned with the orbital angular, the with the magnetic field that uh, it seems to be feeling from the nucleus. Okay, that could affect its potential energy. So we have to add one more term to our Hamiltonian. We need to add a term due to the potential energy of the interaction of the spin and orbital motion. Okay, so we say this is spin orbit coupling. And so the potential energy term that we have to add, we call that as being due to spin orbit interaction. We can think of that as some kind of an internal Zeeman effect. Remember, what was the Zeeman effect? That's splitting of the spectral lines as a result of putting your, your atom between uh, the poles of a magnet, right? So if you're subjecting your atom to an external magnetic field, you have that splitting of the lines. Uh, it's called the Zeeman effect. Well, this one is built into the atom. Just because you've got this electron with its own magnetic, magnetic generating its own magnetic field by uh, inherent magnetic field, and it's orbiting around a nucleus, which is a charged particle. It's going to feel as if there's a magnetic field from the nucleus. You have to add this extra potential energy term. Okay, so that term is that interaction is known as spin orbit interaction. So that leads to a splitting of energy levels, and that allows you to explain further. If you look at your uh, the structure of your spectrum from atoms, there's really fine structures there, smaller splittings of the energy levels that you see in this spectrum that can be explained by spin orbit interaction. When you get to very large atoms, okay, that becomes significant. For hydrogen, it's not very strong. When you get to sodium, for example, we're going to look at the sodium lab spectrum in the lab, uh, in the lab and you'll see that uh, transition, for example, from the 2p orbital to the 2s orbital of sodium you'll see a splitting of the line. Instead of just seeing just one line, you'll see a significant split uh, at, of that yellow line from sodium. And that's due to spin-orbit interaction. Okay? So 
here's an example. Let's say you have a hydrogen atom and you have an electron in the 2p orbital. Because of spin orbit interaction, okay, normally those 2p orbitals are degenerate, right? Six-fold degenerate. What are the six possible ways that an, an atom, an electron can be in a 2p orbital? It can be 2p, 0, m can be plus 1, 0, or negative 1, right? That's your possible m values, and it can either be spin up or spin down. So there's six possible ways. So we say that the 2p orbital or the 2p sublevel of hydrogen is six-fold degenerate. But because of spin orbit interaction, what actually happens is that that 2p sublevel, okay, under very high resolution, if you have a very sensitive instrument, you can actually see that, that actually there's actually two levels there. Okay, we refer to those levels as doublet p one half and doublet p three halves. Okay, and we'll learn to uh, determine these uh, when we get when when we look at a more general case of you have more than one electron in an atom. But for now, uh, the way you interpret this is this p right here. Okay, capital P. That's for uh, the that means that the quantum number for the total orbital angular momentum is 1. That's the code for L equals 1. Okay, in other words, if I were to ask you what is L squared of the psi for a doublet P1, a uh, doublet P1 half, what would be the eigenvalue for that? L squared. And that's going to be L times L plus 1 h bar squared psi of doublet p one half okay so that uh, letter p capital p okay small letter p is for one electron capital p is the total which in this case is also for one electron okay but when we get to atoms with more than one electron we're going to have to use the capital letters for the total orbital angular moment okay now the one half and the three halves label here, okay, that's the total J. That's a quantum number for the total orbit total angular momentum, spin and orbital angular momentum. So J equals one half and J equals three halves. Okay. Those are the quantum num the value allowed values of the quantum number J for the total orbital uh, total orbital and spin angular momentum. So, for example, um, if I were to say uh, j squared psi for the doublet p three halves, what would be your eigenvalues? It's going to be j times j plus 1 h bar squared. What's our j in this case? 3 halves times 3 halves plus 1 and h bar squared right there. Okay? So that subscript there in that uh, label for the state uh, name for the quantum state is the J. So this is P here is the code for L and the 1 half is the code for J. The 2 over here on the left-hand side as a superscript, that's the value of 2s plus 1. Okay? We can say that we have here, what we have here is a doublet. We can think of the, that's also known as the multiplicity. Okay? So 2s plus 1 is the multiplicity. Let me clear this out. Okay. That 2 right there that's called the multiplicity. So we say the multiplicity here is equal to 2s plus 1 and that's equal to 2. Okay? S oops, S here is the quantum number for the total spin angular momentum. Okay? So what's the total spin angular momentum for for one electron? What's the quantum number S? One half. What's two times one half plus one? 
2. Okay, so multiplicity, one way you can define multiplicity is to say that's the degeneracy because of spin. Okay, because if s is one half, then m sub s can be either plus one half or negative one half, right? So this is, there's two ways that your spin, total spin angular momentum can be oriented. It's either spin up or spin down since we only have one electron. So we say our multiplicity is two, okay? So anytime you have a system, you have an atom that has one unpaired electron, okay, immediately you can say that the multiplicity of the quantum states there is two. The degeneracy that we can attribute to the possible orientations of the spin momentum, spin angular momentum is two. It's either spin up or spin down, okay? So uh, this expression right here, the doublet P is called the term symbol. And when we get to atoms with more than one electron, we're going to uh, look at a more general way of uh, deriving that term symbol. So a term symbol tells you what the multiplicity is. In other words, it tells you what the quantum number S is, right? Quantum number S, and it tells you what the quantum number L is. So you use a code letter for quantum number L. When L equals zero, you have what's called an S state. Okay. When L equals 1, you have what's called a P state. When L equals 2, you have a D state. So it follows the same pattern. For one electron, you use lowercase s, p, d. And for uh, more than, uh, if you're dealing with the total angular momentum, you use capital letters. Okay. And your S here is the spin quantum number. Total spin angular momentum, which in this case is just going to be 1 half. Right, so doublet P, you read that, you read this as doublet P, that's the term symbol. Okay. So what happens th is this, in because of spin orbit interaction, okay, what a actually happens is your doublet P, your okay, your 2P configuration, okay, we said Having one electron in a 2p subshell, there are how many ways that can happen? What's the degeneracy? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Well, that is going to split into two levels, okay? The lower level will be, will have two states. This is called the doublet p one half. And it turns out that the, the other, the higher level in this case, would be your doublet p three half. Okay, four quantum states. So there's still going to be six states, but two of those states would actually be lower in energy than the other four. And how do we distinguish between these two quantum states for doublet P one half? This is J equals one half, right? Well, they differ in their M sub J's. Okay, so M sub J would be plus one half or negative one half. Remember, for a given j, your m sub j can go from j to negative j. Okay. So for j equals 3 halves, these four quantum states correspond to what m sub j values? 3 halves, 1 half, negative 1 half, and negative 3 halves. Okay? Now if you have an electron in a 1s orbital, there is no spin orbit interaction. Why is that? What's the orbital angular momentum for an electron in the 1s orbital? There's no orbital angular momentum, so there's no spin orbit coupling there. Okay? And like I said, the evidence for that is in the spectrum. Uh, let's see, I have the link right here. Let me see. Hydrogen fine structure. Let me see if I can look that up. Do a search for hyperphysics. Uh, spin orbit interaction. And you'll see the hydrogen fine structure. So this is the site at Georgia State University. So this is what happens. So uh, you have an electron in a 2p orbital. Okay. In the case of hydrogen, it splits into a doublet p1 half and a doublet p3 halves. 
and that's uh, instead of seeing just one line in the spectrum, you see two. And the splitting of the line is about 4.5 times 10 to the negative fifth electron volt. Okay. Right. Okay. And one other thing about spin, we said it's not just the electron that has spin angular momentum, right? The nucleus itself could have a spin angular momentum. In the case of a proton, for example, the spin quantum number for a proton is one half. In fact, that's the basis for your NMR spectroscopy in organic chemistry. When you, uh, you're looking at the spin of the proton, proton NMR. So uh, interaction of the electron spin with the nuclear spin, okay, can add one further correction to your Hamiltonian. That adds another extra term in your, um, what do you call it, potential energy in your Hamiltonian. Okay, since your electron in the 1s orbital can be spin up or spin down, the nucleus, what's the spin quantum number for a uh, proton? It's one, also one half. So your proton, can, we can say, is also spin up or spin down. Okay, so uh, if your electron spin and your nuclear spin are parallel, it turns out you get a higher energy state, okay? That adds to your potential energy, but if your electron spin and your nuclear spin are anti-parallel, that gives you a lower energy. So that's for the splitting of the so the splitting of the 1s level in your uh, of your hydrogen atom. Okay, it's not due to spin orbit interaction. There isn't any, right? There's no orbital angular momentum for the electron. But under very high resolution, look at the spectrum. There's still a splitting there. Uh, and so that transition between uh, those two states would correspond to a wavelength of around 21 centimeters. Okay, that's a very long wavelength. So a very long wavelength means what in terms of wave uh, in terms of frequency, high frequency or low frequency? That's going to be very low frequency, right? And so that's uh, that's going to be very hard to detect. Uh, but you can so that splitting that the gap between those two energy levels are very small uh, but you can if you're interested in learning more about that you can just do a search for the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen okay and what's the main so if you go to that Georgia State website again, you can find that. Did I start the broadcast? I did not. Okay. So you're looking at a splitting of 5.9 times 10 to the negative 6. Okay. So wait a minute. That's very long wavelength, so very low frequency. 1420 megahertz. Okay. So here you have when the spins are anti-parallel. You have a lower energy as opposed to when the nuclear spin and the electron spin are parallel. Okay. So this is what they use to map the hydrogen in the galaxy. So see applications of this in astronomy. Okay. And those are some resources uh, in your textbook that you can look at. So that's spin and broadcast.